That being said, if you would stand with me, the last few weeks I've been asking you, uh, when I read the scriptures, to stand in a way of honoring God's word and showing respect. And what I'm going to do is read the passage that I'm going to unpack in just a few moments. And it comes from Luke chapter 15. And I'm going to read the first ten verses. Luke 15, 1 through 10. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them a story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the ninety-nine others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and his neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and who returns to God than over ninety-nine others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, as we continue our worship, we ask that you would meet us in the place that we most need to be met. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing to you, my God, my rock, my redeemer. But as we open your word, may we open our hearts and our minds, may we learn, may we grow, may we be different than the way we came in. In Christ we pray. Amen. So, my family and I used to take vacations when I was a kid, and there were five of us boys uh, in the family, and we split it between going to Myrtle Beach and someplace in Florida uh, most years, and there was a time when I was about seven or eight, I was the fourth out of five, and so there was a time when I was about seven or eight where Think. I can't exactly remember whether it was Myrtle Beach or Florida. Let's just say Florida for the sake of the story. And um, we had been driving for probably <coughs> three or four hours. We got up early. We stopped for lunch. And at lunch, uh, as you could imagine, when you're traveling with five boys, there was a lot of chaos. Um, and I think God bless my parents for the drive. I mean, we used to have one of those brown, uh, brown and yellow, or yellow station wagon with brown paneling. Remember those baby you were growing up? Driving up and down the road, we were from Richmond, Virginia, so we were headed to Florida, and it's no short trip. So, you know, and in that day, I don't even know if there were seat belts, but if there were, we didn't use them. <laughs> we were jumping back and forth from the seat to the back, and, you know, my dad constantly, you know, <laughs> doing this. So we stopped for lunch, had a nice lunch, got back in the car, and continued to head south. I think the trip was going to take somewhere between 10 and 12 hours, okay? So we had been traveling for hours. We, uh, when we left for lunch, we got about another 90 minutes down the road, and suddenly, to my youngest brother's great horror, he realized that he had left his Winnie the Pooh at the place that we had lunch. Now this Winnie the Pooh was just a raggedy thing. He was missing an eye. Um, he didn't have any stuffing left. There was no fur. I mean, it was a disgraceful Winnie the Pooh stuffing. My brother had worn off every possible piece of this little rag doll, but he loved this thing. And my brother was about five at the time. And he is just nuts. He doesn't know what to do. And so he, you know, he starts crying. You know, where's Winnie? I need Winnie, you know. One can only imagine in a station wagon full of five boys, my dad, my mom, what this was like. So this is all my dad needed as we were trying to make time to get to Florida, right? So my mom, who was the conscience of our family, decided that we needed to go back. You know, nobody other than my youngest brother and my mom wanted to go back. And so there was some dialogue that occurred in the, in the car. Unfortunately, I don't remember most of the specifics. 
But I remember the event, and I remember the I remember my dad turning the car around um, at the behest of my mom and my youngest brother to go back and get wind, which was going to add another 90, 180, right? So at the end of it all, he went back, he got Winnie, he was still at the restaurant, everybody had taken him, take him back up and continue our trip. And I say all that just to say as we're getting started, have you ever lost something? That meant the world to you, but probably didn't mean much to anybody else. And it just, there was something within you that couldn't rest. And didn't rest. If you've ever had that happen to you, then today's story that we're going to be looking at, in fact, the two stories will speak to you. If you haven't, then maybe in a different way it will. Now, we've been in this series in the parables of Jesus, and we're in about week four now. For those of you who were with us, in week one, there was a story that Jesus told that I started with in this series, where this wealthy landowner had a massive party. You were here, you will remember that, hopefully. Um, and when he had this party, initially he sent out all these invitations to his friends, to his family, to people that he wanted to be at the party. And initially, everybody RSVP what? Yes. yes, they were coming. They were in. They were going to be there. It was going to be a great day, a fun time. And so, based on the RSVPs, he throws, he, he spends all of this time making all of this food, creating this great celebration. And then the day of, somehow, when the servant goes out to tell them that it's time for the party to be ready, all of them make these lame excuses for why they can't come. Like, one by one, these excuses for why they're not going to be there. And you have this wealthy landowner who has spent all this time and all this money creating this big feast for people that he loves, and they've all decided they don't want to be there, or they can't be there. And this makes the landowner what? He's angry. And who would it be? Right? You've spent all this time and money creating this special opportunity for people you love to be together at this big party. But in his anger, he doesn't, like, berate them. He doesn't, like, go cujo and send servants out and bring them in by the scruff of their neck. He lets them be. And rather than spending all of that energy with his anger, he decides that he's going to take that very same energy because it really, his anger comes from a place of hurt and his hurt comes from a place of love. He loved these people that he invited. He wanted to spend his time with them. He wanted his house full. And since it's not going to be full, what he does is from, from that energy of being angry, he turns it towards generosity. And he tells his servant, okay, since they're not coming, what I want you to do is I want you to find all of the people who would never get an invitation to a feast like this. I want you to go out into the town, into the alleys, into the back ways. I want you to find the crippled, the lame, the blind, People who have no family, no friends, who've been left destitute. I want you to find every single one of them, and I want you to bring them in because they are now going to be my dinner guests. And so the servant goes out and does that. And he reports back, he says, yeah, I found about as many as I could, but there's still more space at your table. There's still more room. And he says, well, go outside the town. Room. Go into the highways and byways. Go to the ditches. Go anywhere you can go. Bring anybody you can find and bring them back. And he does that. And the bottom line was is that his heart had a great desire for his house to be filled. He wanted as many possible people at this banquet, at this feast, at this party as he could. Now, do you remember who he was telling the story to? Do you remember when Jesus was telling this story, who he told it to? He was telling the story to religious professionals, to Pharisees, to teachers of the law. And the reason he was telling them this story is because they had an image of God that he didn't have. They thought that only certain people were welcome at the table. They thought that only certain people should be invited. The lame, the blind, the crippled, the sinners, they were not to be welcome. But Jesus, with this story, is turning the tables and saying, you have it all wrong. Everybody's welcome at the table. The only condition required for their coming is their receiving the invitation and saying yes. 
So once the invitation goes out, the only thing that is required is them to respond. And the reason I tell you that, going back to week number one, is this story, that very story, precedes these two that I'm going to tell you today. So he's talking to the same group of people. Now the theme is the same. Why? Because they didn't get it the first time around. See, Jesus is very persistent. If you don't get it the first time, I'll tell you again. If you don't get it the second time, I'll tell you again. If you don't get it the third time, Luke chapter 15, I'll tell you again. He tells four straight stories to the same group of people with the same thing. So after week one, and a little time has passed, I want to come back to these next two stories. Because these next two stories will further solidify a point that is important for you and I as we try to understand exactly who God is according to Jesus. Okay? So let's just unpack this story because I think sometimes when we hear stories, when we're familiar with stories, like the details of them are such that we just kind of zone out. Right? You know something, you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. tell me something new. Right? For how many of you have you heard, when we were reading Luke 15, I just read to you the first 10 verses, how many of you have ever heard the story about the 99 and 1, the one lost sheep, and then the one lost corn? How many of you have ever heard that story, those two stories? Okay. So what I want us to do is we unpack this, and for those of you who haven't ever heard it, this is great, because you can see it with fresh eyes. You can hear it for the first time. And I want you to hear this, because this is important. How we see God impacts how we relate to God. If we have an image or a vision of God that isn't accurate, it's going to impact the way in which we relate to God. So, verse 1. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. When I was reading this this week, I thought to myself, what is it about verse 1 that strikes me? in such a way that causes me to pause here. Because when I was reading it this week, verse 1 really spoke to me. It says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners. Now these aren't just like everyday sinners. These are people who are known for their sin. <laughs> right? These are people with reputations. These are people that other people talk about, make judgments about. And what it says, what Luke says, is that these people were actually drawn to Jesus. They weren't repelled by Jesus. And it strikes me, as Jesus is moving to a place in his ministry where he's now drawing huge crowds of people, that a lot of the people who are drawn to him are people who aren't drawn to the church these days. And I, I ask myself the question, well, why, why is that, that the one that we follow was so compelling, and yet large numbers of us in churches all over the country and world are not so much so? Jesus was one of the most inclusive people you will ever meet. He was welcoming. He didn't keep at an arm's distance those people who had problems. And so rather than like feeling worse about themselves than they already did, they felt in his presence somehow better. They felt welcome. They felt like they had a place somehow. And so they were curious because most of their lives, because of their sin, they hadn't felt that way. And so when he's sitting and talking to these religious leaders, he's telling them this story. And it's directly to them. These are the people who would not want these people. In fact, what they say is, this made the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious laws complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. They got indigestion over this. They couldn't take it. And so they began to think, well, what kind of person is Jesus? This is a guy who is claiming to be the Messiah. And he's teaching all of these people all of these things. But what kind of person? He, he must know what these people are like. And yet, they felt welcome to run him. The very people who should have felt welcome in his presence felt uptight. And the very people 
people who don't feel welcomed among many of us these days felt welcome. The story continues. So Jesus says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness to go and search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And the answer to the question is, are you crazy? I mean, he's teaching them like this is normal behavior. You have a hundred sheep, you're in the middle of a wilderness, you lose one. And of course you would go and try to find the one and leave the other 99 in the middle of the wilderness. That's insane. That's like turning the car around and going 90 miles back to get the food. It's crazy. My brothers and I weren't for that move, by the way. But the one who rescued Wendy was very for it. Why? Because he realized the value of something that meant a lot to him. And he was willing to risk it all to find the one. Well, the guys sit around the table, they don't get this. This is crazy. You would never make 99% of your investment to, to find the one. You wouldn't do it. Who would do it? Nobody in here would do that. Jesus would do it. And he's trying to give them a picture of how God sees the one. How uniquely specific God is with every individual. And how much he cares and what he's willing to do to find even the one. The story would have made a lot more sense to me if he had another buddy shepherd with him. And he said, I'm going to leave the 99 with my friend. Or I'm going to put them up for the night in like some sheep motel. <laughs> I have some place where they can be protected. Because if you leave the 99, what could happen? They could run off and get lost. They could get stolen. Wolves could eat them. You could come back after looking for the one that you might not find and realize that you've lost the 99 too and then you have nothing. So no one would do this. In their right mind would do this. Save Jesus. He continues. He says, and when he found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I don't know whether you notice when he finds the sheep, his response to the sheep. But a lot of times, our response to the lost one when we somehow find him is to give him a nice long lecture about why they've created such stress in our lives by their reckless behavior. We judge them. We punish them. But he didn't beat the sheep. He didn't yell at the sheep. He wasn't angry at the sheep. He was what with the sheep? He was thrilled with the sheep. He had been searching high and low, and finally he found him. And he does what? He takes the sheep and he puts it up on his shoulders. He doesn't put it on a leash and let him drag behind him. He's like one with him. And he brings him back. And not only when he comes back to, is he happy that he's in the fold, what does he do? He calls everybody he knows and throws a party. Now again, you remember in the story that preceded this in week number one, it had a feast. This one has a feast. There's lots of parties going on. There's lots of celebrating going on. He doesn't judge, malign, beat, or give a long lecture to the sheep. He puts him on his shoulders, he brings him home, he calls all his friends, he throws a major party. Why? Because that which was missing is found. Because that which was lost had great value to the one searching for it. He loves his sheep. He's not angry. He's thrilled. But apparently, that story wasn't enough, and the one before it wasn't enough. And so he says, to finish this story, he says, in the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and who have it straight away. And when he's telling them the story, what group are the guys who are sitting around the table? They're the 99. It's like he's just 
Pokey them. There's more joy over this one than you guys who've been sitting around complaining about the one who's gone. And you could have gone and actually helped them. Here's a novel idea. Why don't you marshal your forces and you go out and help me find the one? Why judge? Why malign? Why criticize? Why complain when they show up to the table? They've been invited. I want them here. Two stories isn't enough. So he goes to story number three. And he says, in the same way, uh, or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and she loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me, because I've found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. You get a theme going here? So he talks about a wealthy landowner throwing a party. He then talks about a shepherd losing a sheep. He then turns to this woman who is manic. She has ten coins, and one day she realizes when she goes to check the box that one of her coins is missing, and she can't figure out how it's happened. So she literally turns her house upside down. She is searching high and low for this one coin. One coin. It seems crazy that she would expend so much energy she has nine. Maybe she'll find it in a day or two or a week. Maybe she misplaced it. It could be someplace else. She doesn't have to go so crazy over the one coin, but she does. She lights up the house. She's searching every nook and corner and cranny. And then she finds it. But what's insane is that she calls all her friends and decides to throw a party. Can you imagine when she's extending the invitation to this party? They say, yeah, yeah, I'm up for a party. Why, why are we having this party, by the way? found what? <laughs> We're having a party because you found your missing penny? <laughs> They're like, as good a reason as any, let's go! <laughs> and what you don't realize, maybe it's not spoken, but what is absolutely true, when she invites her friends and family to come celebrate with her, she's going to have to feed them and give them drink, right? I mean, there's no party without something to eat and drink. She's going to spend twice as much on the party as she did as the coin was worth. <laughs> she could have saved herself all the trouble and just went and took a nap and just said, you know, I lost one. She ends up spending probably two times what it's worth. It's crazy. It's like a shepherd who'll go out and leave 99 in the middle of the wilderness to find one. It is insane. Who would do such a thing? And Jesus is telling these religious people, that God would do such a thing. That's how God is. That's who God is. That's how God feels. And it strikes me, next week we'll get, we'll look at the last of the story, which is the most probably familiar and famous, that and the Good Samaritan is the prodigal son. The prodigal son comes as the fourth of those stories that Luke is telling us about how God feels about lost things. And so, when we get to this place where we're looking at that, we have to think to ourselves, wow, if that's what God is like, so then what does that mean to me? Because if God feels that way about lost things, lost people, how much do I? I mean, am I like this manic woman or this crazy shepherd who would risk so much at the thought of someone who's just lost? And listen, oftentimes in these relationships that we have in our lives, we can vilify and make people out to look and seem way worse than probably what they are. But perhaps if we look through the lens of a shepherd who's missing a sheep that they're lost more than that they're bad or wrong, it perhaps might touch our heart a little more deeply to realize that when somebody's lost, they need somebody to go help find them. And I just wonder sometimes if in our own judgments, if we stop seeing people the way God does. Now listen, I don't minimize 
any of the places along the way. This is tough stuff for me to read and listen to myself. I don't minimize that when there are people in our lives who hurt us, who do damage to us, who, who create uh, angst in our lives, stress in our lives, difficulty in our lives, that it feels a certain way. But what if, rather than looking at those people, mother, father, brother, sister, husband, wife, neighbor, enemy, what if we looked at them and saw them as lost rather than bad and wonder what difference it would make? Maybe instead of one shepherd going out to find one lost one, maybe there'd be an army of us searching the hills and the valleys to find that lost one. And rather than judging and maligning when we find them, maybe we could put them on our shoulders and be one with them and celebrate that even though they were notorious in their sin, that there's still a place at the table for them. Why? Because God wants His house to be full. And so I was thinking, you know, the, the story really is spoken to a group of religious professionals. But it applies to us. There's really two points of application. And this is how I'm going to close. First point of application is it may well be today, tomorrow, the next day, next week, next month, next year, you might find yourself in a place of lostness. You know, people like us can get lost. <coughs> And I just want you to know that you have a God who, when you've gotten lost, when you when you royally messed up, when you've become notorious in the things you've done and haven't done, when you have crushed many of the relationships, when you have burned many of the bridges in your life, when so many things have gone wrong, that you're going to be in a place of lostness where you don't even know how to make your way back or even think you could be welcome if you did. And I just want you to remember Luke 14 and 15. Because what Jesus says about God is that He always wants you home. And if that happens to you, and if that is you today, I just want you to know I want you to fix clearly in your mind that God is like a shepherd who is searching for and he would risk it all. And that's what we see in his son. He would risk it all to bring you home. And I just want you to remember that because there's going to be it's going to be a day or a week. I hope it's not so, but if I know life and myself and observation, there's going to be a day and time where you just <coughs> no matter what you've done and how hard it is to come back, I just want you to remember what God is like. So that you don't have to be afraid or ashamed to come home. Because he wants you home more than you want to be home. The second point of application is this. In order for us to understand that and to get that, we need new eyes. We need to see people differently, many of us, than how we do. We need to look through a different lens. We need to look through the Christ lens. We need a different mind. We need to think of people differently. Because our natural impulse is to make judgments against others. It's just, I don't have to practice that. That just comes pretty easy to me. I don't know about you. It's just very easy to see something that I think is distasteful and to think something about it. And maybe not have any of that. But it's just enough for me to see it and make a snap judgment. And in order for us to see it, we also have to think about it differently. And we also need not only a new mind and a new eyes, but we need a new heart. That enables us to feel it differently. Because it's not just thinking it, it's really feeling it to our core. That enables us to respond differently. <coughs> Not until you lose Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Ragged as he may have been, do you realize that it's worth going back 
and spending a few extra hours and delaying your trip and going out of your way. Because when he matters, if only to one. And so for us, sometimes it's easy to become self-consumed with our own needs, our own desires, our own life. But how I'd like to end our service today is um, just by inviting you to join me in a prayer where you would open yourself to the possibility of seeing differently, thinking differently, and feeling differently about that one lost one. Because I would imagine in your lives there's more than just one. But whatever the number may be, they matter to you. And you're just having a hard time seeing them in a right way, feeling about them the right way. So if you would stand, I'm going to close in prayer. <laughs> Yesterday at the end of our memorial service, uh, I asked them to do something I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to open your hands as a sign or a symbol of your openness and your readiness to receive whatever God wants to give you. God may want to give you new eyes. He may want to give you a new mind. He may want to give you a new heart. He wants to give you something that enables you to share His heart and enables you to see what He sees so that you can live as His son does. Because if we're Christians, if we're Christ followers, then we should be followers. And in order to do that, you and I may well need to see things, hear things, think things, and feel things a little differently. So join me as, as I pray. Father, we thank you for a fresh image through Jesus, your Son, as to who you are and what you're about. And in this place today, we are each needing something from you. And some of us might know exactly what that is. And others of us, we might not yet be there. You may speak to us later this afternoon or tomorrow or the next, but we're open now. And we open our hands just to say, God, give us what we need. Hallelujah. Even if we don't know what we need, give us what we need. And lead us into life. Life to the full and life more abundant. And as you give us these things, these gifts from you, help us to realize that you are and to be grateful. As we start to see people differently, as we start to see ourselves differently, as we start to care about the things that you care about, to be compassionate and merciful and loving, pour into our lives all that you have for us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Be good.